So, uh, I'm ashamed to admit this, given how long it just took me to set up the audio here. Uh, my name is Dr. Hugh Reed, and I'm a professor of digital forensics here at Norwich University. So, the irony of having someone uh, with computers coming up and, uh, and, and sharing, uh, sharing things. So, it is my utmost pleasure to be able to chair this session with you this afternoon with some very exciting papers that transcend uh, not only the geopolitical arena, but also a lot of the cyber security space as well. So, I'm really looking forward to hearing what our presenters have to say. So um, without further ado, please allow me to introduce our first presenters. We have uh, Dr. Kozirev, who is an expert in comparative politics, strategic studies, and foreign policy in Eurasia. His major interest is great power politics, east-west relations, international conflict, and the political economy of regionalism and regional integration. At present, he is Professor of Political Science and International Studies at Endicott College in Beverly, Massachusetts. He is also affiliated with the Fairbank Center for Chinese Studies at Harvard University and uh, as associate in research. Uh, joining him up here is also Dr. Goldstein, who is Director of Asia Engagement at uh, Defense Priorities. Formerly, for 20 years, he served as Research Director at the US Naval War College, his expertise includes maritime security and nuclear security issues, with major focus also recently including the Arctic and the Korean Peninsula. He holds a doctorate from Princeton, an MA from Johns Hopkins, SAIS, and a BA from Harvard, and is currently a visiting professor from Brown University. So please allow me to uh, join me in giving them a round of applause in inviting them up to share their research, Russo-Chinese strategic partnership of a new type, the security dimension. Thank you. There you go. Thank you so much. Um, uh, it's a special privilege, privilege for us to uh, both Lyle, Professor Lyle Goldstein and myself to present at this uh, amazing forum. Um, and we would like to express our gratitude to President uh, uh, Onurunmo, uh, Dr. Morris, Dr. Ku, uh, the colleagues at the uh, John and Mary Francis uh, Patton uh, Peace and War Center for this uh, uh, unique opportunity, especially given the, uh, the the topic and the actually the importance of the questions we are discussing today. Uh, General Widener this morning formulated one key task for the current and future strategic planners, uh, uh, which he uh, actually stressed as. Uh, contestation with Russia and China is global in both by sc in scope and in character. Uh, again, once again. So I would uh, tell you one secret. Uh, contestation with the United States has been, uh, for the Russian and uh, Chinese leadership, has been uh, already uh, uh, global uh, in scope and, and, and nature for a minimum for a decade, decade or so. So uh, our paper is devoted to the security uh, partnership and the security dimension of the strategic partnership between Russia and China. And uh, it, it examines the uh, important aspect of the potential Russian-Chinese alliance in the uh, security alliance. Uh, and uh, Professor Graham uh, actually referred to this this morning as well. Uh, and uh, uh, we have tried to answer the three questions uh, raised in our uh, actually paper. So one question is, uh, to what extent we may consider the current crisis as a turning point in this uh, important relationship, kind of mask off type of now revealing the real uh, 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 strategic uh, goals and um, instruments in uh, Russia's and China's contestations with the United, contestation with the United States, and what is the future direction of this partnership might, uh, might look like? Uh, uh, we second a question is uh, what is the nature of this type of this alliance-like relationship that we are seeing uh, um, now have having have being formed now? Uh, and third question is the prospect of new Chinese-Russian uh, security alliance, and would this alliance prompt the United States to prepare for a two? Uh, front conflict in the future that also some of the uh, panelists this morning also referred to this. Uh, the paper actually is divided into three parts, uh, three sections. The first section uh, tries to examine the geopolitical new reality uh, characterized by the uh, U.S. exit from hegemony and the rise of non-Western actors. 
the second section devote, is devoted to the character of the Russian-Chinese partnership with no limits, or friendship with no limits, um, uh, or friendship or partnership of a new type, as they actually characterize this. And the third uh, section is, uh, is devoted to implication, to some study of implications, the implications for strategic planning and missile defense of um, like space uh, cyber co cooperation and uh, research and development cooperation and also economic uh, industrial integration. Um, so uh, our major argument uh, goes um, to the uh, point that the Russian-Chinese uh, actually partnership has already passed certain, uh, you know, uh, uh, in, yeah, like kind of a, uh, broiling point, and now uh, they are uh, at the stage of the changing attitudes to a new proactive behavior. So if only like four years ago, this partnership, uh, China and Russia tried to actually be active in those areas where actually the United States was trying to withdraw, and especially after the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, uh, Russian-Chinese partnership uh, uh, found out that it could be probably doing some more and making this uh, semi-alliance or quasi-alliance more uh, you know, uh, you know, proactive. The uh, second point is the shift from the global collective partnership mantra, which actually Russia and China had been ad advocating for some time, to taming a non-cooperative America by accumulating some critical mass of global systemic influence to leave America no, cho no choice but, but cooperate. Uh, this informs a straightforward counterbalancing strategy of Russia and China. Their partnership in, is gaining a new momentum. Uh, strategic security issues have moved to the center of this quasi-alliance. Uh, and we have been talking uh, for a long time, pretty long time, uh, that actually the uh, relationship between China and Russia w uh, had been based for a long time on mostly political kind of mutual understanding rather than economic understanding. So now we have the enhanced security aspect of this. A new era of counter counterbalancing against the Western dominance uh, means that from previous practice of delegating responsibilities to each other in their respective regions toward a possibly uh, backing each other uh, in all aspects of security. Uh, we've described the uh, operational context. I just put place the major dimensions of uh, how Russia and China are looking at the situation and the global environment. And there are a few points here, five points. Uh, the thesis of destructive America, which America is seen as agonizing and declining hegemony, uh, uh, acting uh, irrationally and unpredictably. So the second point is the so-called Russia and China's savior nations, uh, trying to actually secure, a glo secure global stability. Uh, the third point is that uh, the American demonization uh, thesis of uh, Russia as, and China with their political system as actually hurting or threatening the American domestic political institutions, political system, and, uh, and values. Uh, a, a fourth point is so-called instrumentalism, uh, after, especially after the Trump, U.S. had to address the problem of Western solidarity, and by demonizing Putin and Xi, uh, uh, the United States modified the foreign policy um, has become uh, instrumental for restoring Western unity and uh, securing domestic bipartisan consensus. And uh, the five fifth point, uh, which is seen and uh, actually interpreted by the Russian and Chinese leadership, is the problem of crisis management. Now, under the current circumstances, uh, in the uh, crumbling world order, neither liberal, uh, in originally cooperative or institutions-based uh, means, nor classical bipolarity era deterrence mechanisms properly work to manage the crisis. Uh, we've uh, actually uh, sorted out, laid out some pillars of the more than an alliance partnership, uh, which in, uh, and these pillars include the danger of America's desperate attempt to safeguard global supremacy, uh, these are kind of drivers which inform uh, the Russian and Chinese actions. The so-called uh, thesis about the power-value dichotomy in U.S. behavior and the need to dismiss America's block mentality logic. This power-values uh, dichotomy we described in the paper, which means that uh, it's actually the Chinese uh, theory that uh, it, despite the actually the increase in power and when a country becomes a great power, uh, it doesn't necessarily uh, must it sh should not necessarily be converted into some sort of aggressive behavior. So the values should be uh, should dictate and inform some restraint of a great power. That's what actually China is trying to do. Uh, the imperative to foster multipolarity and manage great power relationship under the auspices of the United Nations. 
advocating the international order and the Russian-Chinese campaign against Western rules-based order, especially the, uh, mm, such elements of this rules-based order uh, actually concept uh, which uh, go to commitment-based order and sovereignty as responsibility of governments before their populations. Sign the Russian self-perceived -perce role of global, of global peacemakers, I've mentioned this, and advocates of economic globalization and strategic complementarity within the framework of a loose alignment. Uh, a couple of quotes uh, uh, just to, telling us that this, uh, the current stage of uh, rapprochement is mostly driven by the fear of war. Uh, one of the uh, presidential advisors and very respectable, uh, actually, pundit in Russia, uh, Sergei Karaganov, uh, quoted in uh, 2018, Russia and China need a joint strategy to strengthen peace. There is no need to wait for some, someone's attack. The threat of war is in the air. And Karaganov, uh, just uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, just uh, tried to explain the war with Ukraine, which was unavoidable. Conflict with the West is just beginning. It's not the end of the conflict, right? Um, and the th uh, three aspects, three areas of security challenges uh, uh, we actually were uh, paying attention to, and I, I hope my colleague, uh, Professor Goldstein, will elaborate more on this. Uh, the prospect of uh, problem of strategic stability, and I, I just posted the major points there. The problem of economic security, and these are also the drivers of uh, uh, like joint and enhanced cooperation between the two parties, and especially the problem of cultural security, and uh, we had some panelists earlier mentioned the uh, actually impact or p possible threat of the uh, Western political institutions and, and values to the uh, actually the regimes, political regimes, which was were established in both Russia and China. And I'm uh, now passing my, the floor to my colleague. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. It's a, it's a real honor to be here. Um, uh, I'll be uh, uh, trying to show you some of the evidence that we're seeing. Uh, um, including on the, uh, the, the Ukraine conflict. Uh, um, th this evidence will be adding to the paper. It's not, most of it is not in there yet. But here you see I watch Chinese military TV basically every night, and I can tell you that it's, uh, it's very favorable toward uh, Russia, uh, you know, whether we're talking about the, uh, this uh, threat from NATO, so-called, or um, you know, here they're showing kind of uh, Russian weaponry that's been captured in the lower left or a, uh, you know, precision strikes so-called in uh, on the right, lower right, and, and uh, destroyed Ukraine tanks. So, but um, I think it's fortuitous to have had the uh, deputy of strategic command here, the, the general this morning. I think he uh, uh, gave us a wonderful introduction here because uh, he, I think, um, elaborated on the um, very extensive Chinese nuclear buildup that we're now seeing. And, um, uh, we assess that this uh, Chinese buildup, you know, may well have Russian characteristics, and here are some of the evidence to, to suggest that Russia has been, uh, sorry, China is sort of learning at the knee of Russia and um, just uh, taking in all kinds of information, including about very, you know, kind of esoteric doctrinal principles like on the lower right about using uh, the use of interference buoys to uh, egress your uh, so-called boomers, but look on the upper right, that's an Iskander, seems to be a very, that weapon I think, I fear, is probably on the minds of the deputy of STRATCOM, but uh, if China goes in for that kind of approach to nuclear weapons, I think we're, we're all in trouble. Um, but let, you know, just to outline here what China is doing uh, and, and how this could be impacted by Russia-China relations, you see uh, you know, some discussion of, of the buildup, what, why they're undertaking this buildup, but I want to emphasize, and this is the same article from a very um, prestigious institution in China, but you look on the lower, on the top left there, how it's, he's explaining that, you know, China doesn't have the enormous striking, nuclear striking power that Russia has, so you begin to see that maybe this is what they aspire to, and, and uh, indeed, that's what the article kind of lays out, and we see that across uh, Chinese sources now, uh, but here you can see them drawing on that uh, perspective of the Cold War and also thinking about uh, tactical nuclear weapons. As you can see, we can talk more about those. Uh, 
Um, but what we see is that Russia and China seem to be coalescing, you know, not only in their perspective, but, but taking concrete actions. On the right, you see a, an article in Vzgled where they were discussing uh, the implications of early warning cooperation. And, and uh, these Russian strategists are outlining, sorry, I don't have the quotes there, but I can refer you to them, but they're outlining how useful this actually is for Russia, not just for China. Uh, and then there's talk about working together in the Arctic, even going so far as to say, uh, Maybe um, you know Chinese submarines could base out of the Arctic. So that you know, I wouldn't say that's a likely possibility in the future, but you know, can't rule it out. Uh, but here's some more evidence just how closely their views align. Here, here you have Chinese strategists saying, "Gosh, we need all of these uh, tactical nuclear weapons that Russia has." Also, and, and on the right, you see a discussion of their uh, very, very closely aligned positions on missile defense. Um, I know we've had some discussion of Georgia already today. Well, here's a Chinese battle map of Georgia. And this should, I put this up to remind you that, boy, do the Chinese want to get their hands on these kind of uh, after action assessments, right? Including in Ukraine. So I think that's going to be a factor going forward. They, they want to know what's going on so that they can improve their own forces. And one more point I want to make. We've talked a lot about NATO here today, but not about China NATO. But here, this is, uh, I took this screenshot in 2017. They were talking about the Korean crisis, actually. But you can already see uh, China not having a very good feeling for NATO, and that has only grown worse. So that's a factor, too. But let me just summarize here um, with our kind of final takeaways here. We see this as a uh, kind of tacit alliance or quasi-alliance, we call it. We think it's both deep and broad. Um, you know, um, we do see a fundamental convergence of worldviews. Uh, we, we kind of think Russia is a, sort of a cornered secondary power, but, but that, that this could be kind of a turning point in their convergence as well. Um, uh, and I would say uh, we think you know, Russia more or less has to accept its junior status. And then there's this question, I'll just end on this point because it's, it's quite interesting, although I think it's still quite speculative, uh, this issue of Russian military, uh, of China's potential military assistance to Russia. And, and I would say we, we've already seen some concrete signs that this probably won't happen. That is, you know, the Chinese have denied it pretty forcefully. But, but if it were to come about, we might understand why. Oh, there's my, I've got my own timer here. Just one, one more point. I'd say to test equipment, to learn those battlefield lessons, to gain market share, and to earn credit, of course, for a Taiwan scenario. And last but not least, you know, to our estimate, uh, China is not ready to, to watch uh, Russia be defeated and will try to prevent its collapse. Whether it can prevent its collapse is unknown, but, but they will try to our estimate. Thank you very much. Incredible food for thought, ladies and gentlemen. Up next, I have the, uh, the very distinct pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Manini uh, Kian, uh, who teaches nat national security and homeland defense, as well as graduate level courses in intelligence, disaster assistance management, national security affairs, and terrorism. Manini Kian received her BA in Russian from Wellesley College and a Master of Philosophy from Oxford University in the United Kingdom, and holds both an MA and a PhD in political science from the University of Michigan. She has taught at the Joint Forces Staff College in Norfolk and is a former US Foreign Services Officer with service in the Netherlands, Russia, and Bulgaria. Let me just uh, switch the paper here for you and we'll be up and running. Oh, thank you so much for the kind invitation to speak to all of you. It's always great to be back at Norwich again. Uh, the last time I spoke here, I also spoke about disinformation, and that was uh, seven years ago in another conference. Uh, and so when I found myself thinking about this topic, I found myself kind of asking that question about continuity and change. What has changed in disinformation, and what is the same? Uh, so what I'd like to do in the paper today is 
Uh, if I don't run out of time, do four things. Just briefly tell you what disinformation is. Uh, and then I want to talk about some of the technological issues. I want to describe this notion of technological affordances uh, and explain what it is about the internet today, what it is about the environment uh, that makes, in I think, uh, disinformation so much more effective than it's really ever been in the past. We know that the Russians are masters of disinformation and they've used it for years, but now they're using using it much more effectively, and they're using it in a much more targeted way. Uh, so I'll give you some examples of old disinformation and new information, uh, and I'll really compare and contrast the two. I wrote this paper kind of before the Ukraine, Ukraine blew up, uh, and so I'm not going to be talking about Ukraine. I'll give you a little bit of a break. Uh, I actually, uh, what I wanted to do was to think about uh, two different cases where Russia has been involved in uh, basically a medical crisis. Uh, and the first example is something called Operation Denver, which occurred in 1983. Uh, back then, the Soviet Union, Soviet intelligence, seeded disinformation, uh, mostly through a newspaper in South Africa that they had a relationship with called The Patriot. Uh, and they seeded this lie that uh, the AIDS virus had been created as a biological weapon at Fort Detrick in Maryland uh, you know, with cooperation with the CIA, and that it was a racist bioweapon which was uh, specifically engineered against people in Africa and the developing world. Uh, and so I wanted to compare that with kind of lies that they're seeding today having to do with COVID. Uh, is it the same story or is it a different story and what makes it different? And I argue that uh, today disinformation is segmented. We can actually identify about 16 different kind of themes and variations having to do with COVID and who created it and who's lying and who's telling the truth uh, versus kind of the one sort of uh, big lie that came out in 1983. Uh, and the other reason that disinformation is so different today is because back then it was pretty much linear. It was you sort of, uh, you know, you were an intel guy, you kind of wined and dined the editor of this newspaper that you'd basically been supporting for all these years. So there was a heavy investment. There was a heavy financial investment in creating this uh, kind of seed that was then going to send this disinformation message out. And the thing is that I refer to it as dumb information as opposed to smart information, that basically it was almost like if you were conducting a psychological operation and you were you know, flying a plane over an area and you were dropping something, you know, a leaflet out of a plane, you don't actually know who's going to pick up that leaflet. You don't know whether or not they're going to read it. And you don't know so much what they're going to do with that information. Whereas today, we have a lot more analytical tools to see who's actually reading a tweet or an Instagram post or a Facebook post and whether they're liking it and whether they're retweeting it and what are their specific characteristics? What do we know about the purchase that that idea is actually having? So that's kind of what I want to kind of take you through briefly. So disinformation is just false information about a country's military strength or plans disseminated by a government or intelligence agency in a hostile act of tactical political subversion. So it's information that's deliberately misleading, but whether we're talking about 1983 or whether we're talking about today, Often there's some kind of grain of truth or some form of uh, kind of pre-existing conspiracy, conspiratorial thought that people might have that that disinformation then latches onto. So if you are someone in South Africa in 1983, you might know that the United States had a race problem, right? They'd had race riots. Uh, so to then say sort of, you know, the US government created this weapon for racial reasons, it wouldn't be totally outside the realm of possibility. You know, probably 99 cents percent it's wrong, but there's some grain of truth that they're able to build on. So that's the same whether that's 1983 or whether that's today. Uh, the idea that disinformation is primarily about subversion. It's a system of calling the values and principles of a system kind of into question. So that idea that it's about kind of degrading the legitimacy of an adversary. Uh, sort of the Soviet Union in 1983 
1863, wanted to degrade the legitimacy of the United States by saying, see, they're not really a democracy. They're creating a racist bioweapon. And furthermore, they're lying. Uh, and that can be very much true today as well. So I start with this picture. And if anybody's ever worked at the Pentagon, they've heard this before, this expression. They use it a lot. They say, when all you've got is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And essentially, what that means is if you have one type of weapon, you're going to be predisposed to do certain things. And there are going to be other things that maybe you're not going to do as well with that weapon. So when we think about the technological affordances designed today uh, that sort of create disinformation and help us to disseminate it, um, the idea is that certain constraints exist. And as I said, what you can do is a function of the tools you have available. Another term that's really important when we think about disinformation today is this idea of emerging technologies. And emerging technology is something that's going to have vast political, economic, and social significance. And it's often very unpredictable. And if you read my whole paper, I talk a lot about something called customer relations management software. Uh, and it's software as a service that you subscribe to uh, that's created by basically you're outsourcing your customer relations management, your database management, your uh, mailing list, things like that, to someone outside your organization. And they often store your data as well. And what I argue in this paper is customer relations management software allows you to create a list of users, people who have engaged with you and your product. You can track their engagement with you and their product. And at the end of it, you could sell them sneakers, or you could sell them a lie about US foreign policy. You can use the same software to do both things. So it's a dual use technology. Uh, and when we talk about uh, sort of uh, customer relations software as an emerging technology, nobody ever really thought, gee, people are going to use this to schedule disinformation posts. Uh, one thing that's really important uh, is the fact that the people that have created this didn't intend for it to be used as this purpose. And as a result, as the general talked about this morning, he said, you know, that there are these security risks that are coming, about, they're coming about that uh, commercial and private companies need to be drawn into this conversation about security. Uh, and this is a really good example of the ways in which companies need to be aware. And they need to be doing more to kind of fight how this uh, software and things like that are being used. Uh, there was a. Last week, there was an article about how this company, Salesforce, was called in by the January 6th commission in Washington. And it was because someone had used Salesforce to create a list of people to invite them to the insurrection. And what's interesting is if you do the ethical uh, training uh, on Salesforce, there's a lot of stuff about money laundering. But there's actually nothing about, you know, People might attempt to use this software to organize an insurrection, because that was really an unintended consequence. Um, so the social media environment has easy costs of entry. It's really cheap to get an account. Uh, anyone can play. Uh, it's non-hierarchical. We have this thing called the epistemology problem. Everybody's opinion appears to be equally valid. So I have this little cartoon here. And last week, everybody was saying, oh, so you know, you gave up your PhD in epidemiology, and now you're a Sovietologist, right? Uh, this idea that everybody's sort of an expert in whatever the topic of the day is. This idea of the attribution problem, often stuff shows up online. We're not really sure where it came from. Uh, lately, a lot of the Russian disinformation appears to be coming from Portugal. I have no idea why. Uh, and finally, this idea of the four Vs associated with big data, velocity, how quickly information changes online, veracity, the difficulty of knowing whether or not it's true, uh, the great volume and the great variety. So in other words, there's a huge attack surface today for disinformation. Back in 1983, it was basically a newspaper. And today, it can be any number of different types of social media. Uh, the reason I have a picture here of porch furniture is, again, I want you to remember, just like uh, a lot of this software can be used to sell you a piece of porch furniture. It can also be used to sell you disinformation. Uh, 
Today we talk about sort of the democratization of social media as well. That has nothing to do with sort of democracy as a form of government. Really what it means is you no longer need a PhD in computer science to perform a lot of these activities online. And one thing that we're starting to see more and more is not only can you use something like commercial uh, customer relations management software, but you can use an add-on that has artificial intelligence added. And the artificial intelligence components can run an analysis. They can see which of your various messages are the most effective. And then they can go on and they can basically boost the most effective messages for you. Uh, and so we could be moving towards a future where disinformation is happening and there is no human in the loop. It's possible that there can be an algorithm that's choosing the most effective messages and it's boosting those the most quickly. Uh, the other thing about this, uh, when I talk about democratization, is the idea that adding this AI to your uh, messaging program uh, really can be done by anyone. Uh, it's not terribly complicated to use a lot of these programs now. Uh, so when I say that we have dis, uh, smart disinformation today, I really mean three things. Uh, when we think about uh, smart weapons, they often have these three characteristics. They're remote guided. You don't need to be in the place where the uh, kinetic activity is taking place. And in the same way, you don't need to be in the same place where the disinformation is taking place. They're precision guided. You can choose often a pre-existing group of people who are going to be particularly predisposed to reach your message. Uh, so for example, when we think about COVID, one thing that's different about the disinformation there is Russian uh, disinformation merchants trying to sell you that lie. They specifically reached out to groups that had already indicated that maybe they were refu vaccine refusers. Uh, so they were able to find groups that they could then message in and uh, kind of attach their messages to. So in this way, we have this sort of uh, kind of symbiotic or parasitical relationship with other groups that might provide particularly fertile soil for that message. So you're no longer just kind of throwing those seeds into the air. You're choosing specific targets. And then finally, this idea that just like a smart weapon is dynamic. It can change its trajectory in mid-course as it gets more information. That's true as smart disinformation as well. Uh, what we see and we can track uh, even with the recent uh, Ukraine is ways in which sort of the Russians are changing their messaging. They're maybe uh, kind of throwing out a theme. It's not working particularly well. And so instead, they're choosing a different one. Uh, so here are just some quick slides, and I got all of these uh, from a, a website called socialbearing.com. If you like to look at this stuff, it's fun. We can see here a hashtag of, t of hashtags that are kind of often appear together. And so if you look for sort of who used Biden's war and the way they used it, you can see how it was sort of piggybacked onto existing uh, messaging. Uh, and you can also see that half of these tags uh, were in Castilian Spanish, which seems a little unusual. Uh, so this may have been some form of a buy of uh, you know bots or something like that occurring. Uh, this interesting hashtag, not in my name, which appears to be used by Russia's uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. They want people to say, it's not my war. They want Americans to say, I don't want to, OK, I'll finish up, uh, contribute to the war in Ukraine. And we see the way in which this hashtag has been sort of dumped onto other existing conversations. Uh, and so as we said, it is also dynamic. Uh, and then finally, this idea of sentiment analysis. It's possible to uh, look at unstructured data on the web using a variety of programs to figure out whether the tweets are favorable or unfavorable and kind of which way the wind is blowing. So disinformation today, it's a lot more dynamic. It's a lot more fast moving. Uh, and it appears often to be a lot more effective. Uh, so thank you for your time. Thank you very much.
For our third presentation in this afternoon's session, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Shanesh, who is a, a Maria Sklodowska Curie Actions Research Fellow, the Department of Sociology and Social Anthropology, Central European University, Vienna in Austria. She is currently hosted by the John and Mary Francis Patton Peace and War Center as a visiting scholar and is a senior fellow at the Center for Global Resilience and Security at Norwich University. She holds a PhD in systemic functional linguistics from the University of Sydney. Her most recent work investigates Russian disinformation campaigns on Twitter and the links between climate change and violent extremism. Joining her is Mr. Perry, who is a research associate, uh, uh, pardon me, a research associate with the Norwich University John and Mary Francis Patton Peace and War Centre. His research interests include information warfare, international migration and social cybersecurity. Mark holds a Master of Arts in International Policy and Development from the Middlebury Institute of in International Studies in Monterey, California. Thank you. If I could invite you to the podium, folks. Okay, first of all, I'd like to thank um, all the organizers of this conference for uh, obviously organizing a very timely uh, conference um, and for giving us the chance to present our research here today. We are both very honored to do so. Oh, we're one slide ahead here. I'll go. So today we'll be discussing weaponizing the Syrian civil war, Russia's Twitter war on terror. Um, now, Dr. Sinesh and I have come to this problem set in part by recognizing a gap in the way many researchers are looking at information warfare. On one side, we have this rapidly booming uh, number of studies leveraging computational linguistics and uh, data science methodologies to identify the key themes, topics, phrases, sentiments, uh, and network characteristics of mis- and disinformation online. Um, however, many of these findings are not then connected to uh, how information functions um, as part of coordinated information operations and their strategic purposes. On the other side of this gap, we have this established and very robust body of literature um, discussing Russia's strategic doctrine of information warfare and how it's waged around the world. Uh, but many of these studies do not then show how uh, the strategy is manifested in real data um, happening in real time. So in order to try to thread this needle, uh, we approach the subject to analyze the linguistic anatomy of Russian information warfare on Twitter uh, such that what is being said can be better connected to why it's said and what its uh, strategic um, import could be. Um, so first research question here, how did Russia frame its own involvement in the Syrian civil war? Secondly, how did Russia portray the international coalition's involvement uh, as led by the United States? And following this, we'll have a discussion as to how tactics and strategy in the information space uh, appears to connect to kinetic uh, operations on the ground. So the data. On the information side, we have a corpus of tweets accessed from Twitter's information operations archive. Um, in this case, we have 100 accounts uh, comprising um, of accounts linked reliably to the Russian GRU and uh, Internet Research Agency, which were uh, banned and then subsequently released to researchers in this archive. Um, something important to say about these is that they are covert and unattributed, meaning they're not attributed to the Russian state um, but rather they're troll accounts pretending to be real people on the ground, uh, journalists, uh, observers. Here we see the key statistics of our data. We have over 50,000 tweets, um, close to 2 million words. And this is all between 2016 and 2020. On the kinetic operations side, our data comes from the Armed Conflict Event and Location Data Project. It's an open source uh, data source uh, for which we can filter by uh, time period, so we're matching up 2017 to 2020 uh, in both of these analyses. Um, and we can also filter by actor, uh, primary targets, and uh, event types, such as battles, violence against civilians, riots, strategic developments, etc. cetera. Uh, so with that, I'll hand off to Dr. Sinesh to introduce our linguistic methodologies and analysis. Thank you, Mark. Um, so, um, Professor Gostev, I'd like to pick up on your comment previously. You described what happened in Syria on the ground. So our perspective today is to describe what happened, happened in the information space simultaneously. So we'd like to bring a linguistics perspective that often 
uh, is missing from the study of information warfare, uh, maybe except for computational linguistics and sentiment analysis studies. Uh, and we hope that we can show you how linguistic analysis can offer quite a fruitful framework for the study of information operations. Our uh, methodology is called the Corpus Assisted Appraisal and Cluster Analysis, but today we don't have time to introduce you to the entire framework, so we'll only focus on the Corpus Linguistic um, Methodology, which enables automated quantitative analysis of linguistic data uh, to process really large data sets, sorry. And it also enables um, qualitative analysis of language in its context. So the software that we use is called Sketch Engine, and you see all these different functionalities, which I don't have time to explain. Today, we'll focus on what's called word list and concordance analysis. So typically, the first step in processing a really large data set with corpus linguistic methodology is to search for uh, the top 10 or 20 most frequent words in the corpus. The software also gives you a frequency per million count, which means that in every one million word, words, a particular expression on word is mentioned that many times. So in, this, in our data set, we found basically four semantic categories uh, that concern the United States, Russia, and then you see references to people and civilians, and also to terrorists and militants. So we wanted to explore especially these four semantic categories in further detail. So um, the four clusters that we found concern the human uh, collectives of terrorists and civilians and the collective entities of the United States and Russia. And now we're going to show you some actual examples from the data set to see how Russia portrays the involvement of the United States in the Syrian conflict and how they portray their own involvement. So the next step in Corpus linguistic analysis after performing um, big data searches typically includes concordance analysis, which means that we can search for the most frequent words. So in this case, we perform the wildcard search for the words militant and terrorist that have more than 3,000 hits in the data set. The asterisk means that we can search for different forms of the same word, whether it's singular or plural, uh, we can search for references and synonyms. So if the, if, uh, the data set includes lots of references to different terrorist groups like ISIS, for example, that, that can be included in the search. We can input a list of search terms in, into the software and find um, all the references to them. So another function uh, that we typically use uh, when we do concordance analysis is this uh, advanced context filter function, which means that uh, we can filter the context for a particular entity. In this case, we filtered the context of the tweets for the United States, and that includes several references, like you can see highlighted here in these, in these uh, illustrative examples, like Russians re referring to the United States um, as the Americans, the US military base, US military instructors, the United States, US intelligence agencies, and, and a range of references uh, to the US. What we identified when searching for militants and terrorists and their synonyms and references filtered for the context of the United States is that the, ver the verbs train and recruit kept coming up over and over again. So basically, the first message that we identified as an information tactic is that the United States is recruiting and training militants and terrorist groups in Syria. Imagine this, I'm only showing you uh, selected concordance lines, but this strategy was recurring in thousands and thousands of tweets in the data set. So the second information tactic relates to the United States killing civilians. Uh, we performed the same kind of analysis searching for um, wildcard searches, including uh, references to civilians, the local population, Syrians, people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And filtering the context for the United States, we identified that the, the one verb that kept coming up constantly was killed. And again, this is based on thousands and thousands of tweets. So the second information tactic that um, Russia deployed in this information war in the context of the Syrian civil war portrays the United States as a civilian killer. 
Typically, the way we do um, data analysis using corpus linguistics methodology is that we move from the quantitative data to the qualitative data and then back. So then after, after finding these um, two clusters, we reprocess the data set uh, with the word sketch function of sketch engine. So you can see that the verb kill had more than 1,300 hits in the data set, and this verb collocates most frequently, oops, sorry, most frequently with civilian and people. And again, filtered for the context of the United States, these three confirms our finding previously that we, we found based on the qualitative analysis, now quantitatively. So then we moved on to looking at tweets that um, uh, portrayed Russia in a certain light and their involvement in, uh, in uh, Syria. In this case, again, we searched for the words militant and terrorist. But in, in this time, we filtered the context for Russia. And the, all the synonyms that um, Russians used to describe themselves, you, you can see here Russian Aerospace Forces, Russian Air Force, Russian Air Defense System. So often they talk a lot about their capabilities. And then filtering the context for Russia, the verb that kept coming up in relation to uh, the keywords militants and terrorists is destroyed and killed and eliminated. Uh, so you see here examples like Russian Aerospace Forces killed dozens of militants, and then they list uh, uh, different geographical locations, for example. So this was the third information tactic that we identified in Russian information warfare in the context of the Syrian civil war. Russia portrays its, its own involvement as the ones that killed the militants and the terrorists. And in fact, they entered the Syrian civil war saying uh, that, or claiming that they are fighting international terrorism. We rerun the data set uh, using the quantitative analysis again. So we found that the verb eliminate, for example, collocates most with the words terrorist, uh, gunmen groups, uh, mercenaries, etc. So this reconfirms again how Russia is portraying itself as uh, the killer of terrorists in Syria. And the final information tactic that we'd like to show you today is um, how Russia portrayed its uh, involvement when it comes to the local Syrian population. So when we s performed wildcard searches for civilians and refugees, the local Syrian population, filtering the context again for Russia, we found that one word that kept coming up in thousands and thousands of tweets was the word humanitarian. So we were interested to see that result, like what's Russia got to do with anything humanitarian. So here you can see examples like the Russian military provided humanitarian aid to the people of Umm al-Izam in Homs. Um, and, and this was the fourth information tactic uh, that we identified. And then when we performed the final quantitative analysis, uh, searching for the word humanitarian, you can see it most often collocates with the word aid, convoy, assistance, catastrophe, corridor, crisis, intervention, et cetera, et cetera. So, when trying to summarize our findings, um, we called the information tactics uh, that Russia used to portray the United States as a sort of, in a, in a light that um, shows the moral inferiority of the United States uh, as terrorist recruiters and civilian killers. Uh, and you see that these information tactics can be realized by recurring linguistic patterns, saying the same thing over and over again. So terrorist recruiter is realized by direct mentions of the United States recruiting and training militants and terrorists. A point I want to make here is that in these information tactics, the name of the United States is always put up front. Uh, there is no doubt about the actor who is um, named in these uh, information tactics. The same strategy is used for civilian killer. The US is. Um, killing X number of civilians. This was the same recurring linguistic pattern in, in the data set. And in contrast, Russia is portraying itself as moral, morally superior to the United States and also military, militarily more capable because they are the ones that destroy and kill militants and terrorists. They are the terrorist slayers. And they are also morally superior because of their humanitarian intervention. So we named this fourth information tactic, Russia the Humanitarian. And now I'm handing back over to Mark to sum up. Okay, thank you, Esther. Now, uh, these information tactics continue to possess a bit of uh, strategic ambiguity, perhaps, uh, when seen only in the information space. Um, 
But when we consider uh, what Russia was pursuing on the ground kinetically at the time, a uh, clear image emerges. Uh, the first thing to note here, well, the top chart here shows uh, the main targets of Russian military intervention over time. The gray indicates terrorist targets, blue civilian and orange um, other opposition groups. And we can see right away that despite the information tactics uh, claiming Russia was in Syria to fight terrorism, uh, terrorism remained a consistently minimal focus of the operation as opposed to civilians and other armed opposition groups. And these first two Russian-centric information tactics align with initial ramp-up periods in 2017 uh, and later in 2019. And the humanitarian tactic in 2017 even appears to lag slightly behind increases in civilian targeting, which would align with what NATO strategic communications would call perhaps uh, the Russia's fog of falsehood attempts to obfuscate uh, civilian casualties. Um, Likewise, uh, while one and two appear as force-justifying tactics uh, in ramp-up phases, uh, three and four America-centric tactics continue rather progressively over time. And interestingly enough, uh, in 20, late 2018 and early 2019, when there's a sustained lull in operations during a, um, a sustained demilitar demilitarization agreement uh, between Russia and Turkey, we see this, these two information tactics take over and from then onward, they remain the dominant information tactics. Um, I'll try to wrap this up quickly here. With this context in mind, uh, we consider information tactics to cluster into two strategic narratives that in turn align with established uh, strategic aims of the Kremlin in the international uh, competition space. So firstly, Russia tries to project itself as a global superpower. That's Russia's superpower strategic narrative, which is realized in our data through tactics one and two. And likewise, they also seek to undermine the influence of the West in the international competition space, realized by tactics three and four. And so what? So here are our final conclusions. Uh, what, do our, what does our research um, have to do, and what can it do in the broader field of information warfare study? Uh, firstly, again, as our colleague at the Naval War College noticed, um, Russia didn't have to be everywhere physically. And I would suggest perhaps, uh, at least in part, uh, that may have been helped by them being aggressively present in the information space. Um, and when they're in the information space constructing these narratives, they create these virtual realities um, that enable the pursuit of kinetic objectives, often in direct contrast to how events are framed in the information space. Secondly, we see consistent discrepancies between claims targets and actual targets. Uh, that's a consistent and complementary relationship there. And thirdly, if we think about how this uh, has implications for Ukraine, uh, we continue to see Russian information warfare uh, make use of these diametrically opposed symbols of innocent civilians and violent extremists, uh, be they terrorist, terrorists or neo-Nazis in their narratives. Uh, and again, although it's anecdotal at this point, we could even say that the uh, sequence appears similar, where troop buildup and initial invasion ramp up uh, seems to align with um, these force justifying tactics that frame uh, the Russian invasion as protecting against, protecting innocent civilians against neo-Nazis and uh, potential genocide. Um, and we again see consistent discrepancies between claims, neo-Nazi targets, and actual often civilian targets. And lastly, future research, because our information tactics and strategic narratives are fundamentally made up of recurring linguistic patterns, uh, we believe there's strong potential for future research to construct models that can recognize and detect emerging strategies and tactics as, as they emerge in real time. And secondly, we hope that our research can contribute to pushing information warfare scholarship closer to social cybersecurity perspectives, uh, meaning the focus uh, is on targets that are uh, human and social rather than uh, strictly informational and infrastructural in the cyberspace. So with that, uh, we look forward to hearing questions and comments. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. At this point, I would like to invite our discussant, Dr. Mark Parker, to come up and share his comments on what uh, he's observed from the three wonderful presentations this afternoon. Uh, Dr. Parker is an Associate Dean of, of Continuing Studies and Associate Professor in of Interdisciplinary Studies. He received his bachelor's and master's degrees from Florida State University and his PhD from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. 
His, er his area of specialization is technology, mediated communication in education and the workplace. Thank you, Dr. Parker. Thank you, Dr. Reed, and uh, I'd like to express my thanks to all of the scholars uh, who are on uh, our panel today, both for the, uh, the terrific research that they've done and also for joining us today uh, to share some of the results of that uh, research in the context of, uh, of our conference. Uh, as I was uh, listening to and, and absorbing uh, what was being said, uh, I noticed an interesting, uh, an interesting pattern uh, starting here among the, uh, the various presentations. I noticed uh, in particular that um, uh, Dr. Manjikian's uh, presentation at her research struck me as doing a very good job of setting the stage uh, for what uh, all of the panelists were talking about today. She took a look at a disinformation campaign from the 1980s. Uh, she mentioned specifically the disinformation campaign surrounding AIDS in the African continent. And she looked, she compared and, and contrasted that to, uh, to what was done more recently uh, with, the, uh, with the COVID outbreak. And she looked at it, instead of looking at it from the point of view of rhetoric, she was looking at it from the point of view of the impact of the technology, which is something that I think, although we're all aware of it and there have been, uh, there is a large body of literature dealing with um, the nature of the technology, how it's changed, how it's impacting human communication and so on. This is actually, um, I think an excellent way of setting the stage, uh, Dr. Manjikian, for, uh, for what your fellow panelists were talking about today. I would particularly draw your attention, and if for those of you in the audience, uh, our, among our student body, those of you who are younger, you've grown up in this information environment. You've grown up with technology that allows text and allows narrative to be multi-directional, to be constantly changed, constantly modified, to be uh, what I believe Dr. Manjikian referred to uh, at one point as a force multiplier. It increases the, the, um, the, both the speed and the range of information. It's no longer a case of a single document written by a person that is archived that moves forward, the changing and dissemination of which is very slow and very painful. The information environment that you're used to operating in is multi-directional. Uh, it is uh, a different type of text than from what of those of us who are older are used to dealing with. So the, um, I, I don't think it can be overemphasized, uh, the fact that the technology has changed and it continues to change. And it changes the way information, or in the case of Dr. Manjikian's work, disinformation uh, can, be, uh, can be put forward and promulgated. Uh, Dr. Manjiki and I can understand over the last couple of weeks you were probably strongly tempted to take a look at Ukraine. Uh, I imagine that may be outside of the scope of what you have, but uh, in any event, I imagine you're seeing some things coming true uh, with the, uh, the work that's being done uh, on disinformation in Ukraine. Um, moving then on to uh, Dr. Zhenish and uh, to Mr. Perry. They took that larger uh, idea of Dr. Manjikian's about the changing nature of the technology, the disruptive and the amplifying nature of the technology, and they, do, they did a very good mixed methods uh, research study uh, into one particular uh, technology, social media, and one particular platform, which is Twitter. Uh, again, de-emphasizing rhetoric and looking more at the idea of, uh, of computational linguistics, which uh, I understand has a smaller corpus now and which is probably long overdue uh, in terms of, uh, of, of being a way of looking at this. Um, it's, it, what really struck me about that is the fact that picking up on Dr. Manjikian's theme, um, the impact of something like Twitter when it comes to uh, taking the, the, the high level foreign policy of a nation like Russia, uh, trying to come up with this narrative of the decadent West uh, is in general and the decadent United States in particular is falling apart. Therefore, it's causing chaos and disruption throughout the world, uh, whereas Russia is, is, is a little bit firmer and, and is able to do both humanitarian and, and military success. Uh, that struck me in particular, and it's worth keeping that in mind as you reflect on this. And then finally, uh, Dr. Coldstein and Dr. Uh, Kozarev 
uh, they brought us back up to that, that sort of high foreign policy level. They're talking about foreign policy decisions being articulated, particularly as it relates to China and Russia and their evolving relationship. And again, coming back to this idea of the, the theme of the technology, how these things are communicated, right down into disinformation and, and uh, information warfare. We have the phenomenon of the official pronouncements of foreign policy by, by two nations, both individually and together, and that is going to have to be translated down through technology, through media, through other kinds of channels. And uh, the other members of the panels, I think, have shown uh, just how powerful that can be uh, as a, a disinformation tool, perhaps even a disinformation uh, weapons. So uh, I was very pleased at, at how all three sets of, of, uh, of viewpoints actually came together on this idea that uh, in Russia, in China, uh, as a, over and opposed to the West and, and to the United States, there are two very different narratives uh, about who's good and who's bad, and there are a great many uh, different ways of trying to push that narrative out, uh, as Dr. Manjikian said, to increasingly targeted audiences for that information to be absorbed and possibly passed along. So I thank all of our, uh, I thank all of our, our panelists for doing that. Uh, for those of you in the audience, as you reflect on what you heard today from our various panelists, I would ask you to keep that idea of the technology in mind, partially because it is a force multiplier for disinformation and for information warfare. But also remember the fact that the technology can be helpful for you as well. Irrespective of whether you're going into the military, space, the government space, the private space, whatever it may be, uh, just as the technology is increasing the rate and, and the power of, of disinformation uh, throughout the world, particularly to places where there is already a pre-existing bias to believe uh, certain types of disinformation, you've seen that the technology is also emerging as a tool that can be used to augment your own critical thinking, your own critical analysis of the information that you're hearing, your own attempts to try to sort through this tidal wave of information that you're constantly getting as a result of these new emergent disrupting technologies. There are techniques available, uh, particularly the big data techniques that, uh, that Dr. Zanish and Mr. Perry talked about. Uh, the communication environment has changed. It is going to continue to change. And I think that the type of, of work that uh, our various panelists uh, have been doing to try to, to show the ways in which the technology is changing things, uh, this is going to be an emerging area for all of you, again, irrespective of what sector you're going to be operating in. So I, I ask you, especially our students in the audience, to continue to draw upon your own critical thinking, your, your own critical analysis of what's happening around you, but also to invoke the use of tools, whether technological or mathematical or both, to try to deal with this large amount of information, to sort through what is uh, information, what is disinformation, what is misinformation. And um, with that, I think I'm going to cut my uh, remarks short because the questions that our students ask are always more interested than my comments on everything. So thank you very much, everyone. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Parker, for your, for your comments. Very much appreciated. At this point, indeed, as, as Dr. Parker said, uh, this is time for, for questions. So I would certainly invite anyone that has any questions for any of our wonderful authors here today to come, uh, to come down to either microphone. There's one, to, one on my left and one on my right, or again, one on your left and one on your right as well, I suppose. So if you'd like to, to please uh, come along and form an orderly queue, I'm happy to take questions and direct them as appropriate. While we're, while we're waiting for, for people to, uh, to come down, I would just like to, to put one or two questions forward to, um, uh, firstly, to Dr. Kozirev and uh, Dr. Goldstein. Um, so a little, a little outside the, the scope, perhaps, is this question, but, uh, but Putin achieved what NATO has been trying for, for many years, to increase Germany's expenditure on its, on its military. Uh, Germany is now third only to the US and China in expenditure. So as you've certainly noted the, the, the closening relations between China and, and Russia, uh, do you feel that there is going to be a, a, a shift in the nature of the US and its allies, like perhaps working more closely with 
Germany, perhaps, and uh, maybe foregoing things like the so-called special relationship with the UK and other existing pieces. Do you, do you see a change in that, or do you think it's just a general strengthening of, of NATO going forwards? I think it's pushing Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're exactly right that unquestionably the one of the results of the war uh, thus far is this dramatic strengthening of NATO. So that, you know, that's what seemed to be completely contrary to Putin's objective. So, um, you know, I think as, as was said this morning, that seems to be, a, um, if not a total fail, a close. I, you know, as far as the larger dynamics there between uh, China, Russia, China, NATO, I, I, I think it, I fear that it is a kind of, um, you know, uh, those of us in the field, we call it the security dilemma, you know, which is it's hard to pinpoint who is threatening whom. And uh, it is, uh, you know, there's been, I'll just give you an example. In the, China is very concerned about this um, AUKUS deal. You may have heard of that with the Australia, UK, and, um, and uh, the United States working together on nuclear submarines. So, but what was shocking is that when the AUKUS was first rolled out uh, last year, uh, the Russians took a very, uh, very strong position, which was kind of odd because, you know, Russia has plenty of nuclear submarines and they're not really, um, you know, maybe this in a way would, could even be good for Russia, right? More nuclear submarines go toward the Asia Pacific. Uh, but, you know, you could see uh, the Russians wanted to make it clear almost to their Chinese friends that they were uh, viewed this as a dramatic uh, threat. So, um, you know, my impression is this is, um, I mean, it's almost a chicken and egg question as to which, uh, it, but, but we are certainly moving in a way toward, uh, toward a kind of new, new enhanced bipolarity or, uh, or you might call it a new Cold War. Okay, uh, great question. Uh, we will definitely see the uh, changing role, uh, change the role of Germany in the near future. It's uh, a matter of big concern in Russia, and I believe that now, especially after Chancellor Scholz uh, said that now it, we should not blame Germany any longer, so we have some other other to blame uh, for war in Europe. So, and there's a, there's a big, uh, you, know, uh, you know, question for Russia, and uh, especially given the uh, German policies um, mostly based on some values uh, rather than ge geopolitical calculations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your answer. I'll, I'll defer to, uh, to yourself, sir. Hello, um, Cadet Blake. Uh, my question was for Mr. Goldstein and Mr. Koizarev. So my question was, how dedicated is China to a Russian alliance? And at what point does Russia become a liability? And then furthermore, from a global perspective, is Russia only as strong as a Sino-Russian alliance, or do they warrant a considerable threat on their own? Uh, uh, for, for China, Russia has been since the early 2000s as a non-Asian ally, a non-Asian partner, uh, because China honestly has not been, uh, you know, gaining lots of uh, many allies, both in in that Northeast Asia and in other parts of the world. So I thought probably for the Chinese leadership since the early 2000s, the big rise of Russia and especially centralized Putin's vertical of power. Uh, served as a good like uh, role model, an example for their own kind of ad advancement and also modernization of their own institutions. So they uh, considered Putin as a, an aspiring rising statesman uh, concerned uh, about the Russian national interest. So in terms of uh, cultural, civilizational, and probably uh, despite the differences in languages, uh, they, but the uh, kind of common past in terms of communist past, and in terms of the, uh, the role of sovereignty and uh, their perception of uh, the unique way of democratization. They call, for example, the Russia and China calling themselves as a democratic, a democratic country, unlike uh, the West, uh, the, what, just what the West actually uh, s s has been talking about Russia and how the West has assessed the Russian and Chinese uh, political system. So I think that that alliance is uh, valid, not only from the strategic perspective as a p potential area, a kind of uh, backing, a strategic area for the Chinese if they encounter with the United States, but also as from the political and cultural standpoint as well. Yeah, just a quick comment. I mean, 
Yeah, I think we, we generally, um, people are in the West seems to us uh, underestimating the nature of this uh, quasi-alliance. I mean, I, I've been wondering why this occurs. It, it, part of it clearly is, you know, our understanding of the Sino-Soviet conflict, and we, we've badly misread that, and so I think we've kind of overcorrecting the other way. Uh, but I think also we look at it kind of with ideological lenses, maybe sometimes, and that, that doesn't necessarily help. But there's also a lot, so much happens in Russia-China relations that we don't really see. It's not reported on, but you know, you have to either read Russian or Chinese, I think, so that's a problem too. So, uh, But the last part of your question, um, you know, I, we can get into this more tomorrow, but I mean, Russia on its own, is it is it on its own a threat? That's a really good question. I mean, you know, part of what we're seeing is just how weak Russia is, right? I mean, you know, think about that. Uh, they spend so much on nuclear weapons and all these kind of high-tech weapons. You can see their conventional forces seem to be, you know, again, substantially weaker than, than maybe we thought. So it raises an interesting question that Russia on its own may be not, really not that much of a threat. <laughs> you know, Germany can handle it, uh, if you will, um, right? But, but in combination with China, I think there maybe we do need to be concerned because the two powers, I think, have, are quite complementary in many ways. Um, oddly, you know, we could go into that more, but there I do think, you know, this could be dangerous for, for U.S. national security, this combination. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll, uh, I, I believe you're next, sir. Would you care to ask? Thank you, Dr. Reed. And thank you to everyone for taking the time to deliver your presentations and research today. I thoroughly enjoyed them, as I'm sure everyone else did. And the question that I will pose isn't directed toward anyone specifically, uh, rather anyone willing to take a stab at it. So big tech companies have been said to have taken a stance on the Russia-Ukraine conflict by preventing Russian state media on their platforms as a means of preventing the spread of mis- or disinformation. More recently, the same companies have allowed more, quote, hate speech on their platforms directed towards Russia. While this all may be authorized under Section 230 of the Communications and Decency Act, do you see big tech's involvement as positive, negative, or quite possibly as virtue signaling? Thank you. I'll happily invite uh, Dr. Shinesh. It seems like it's in uh, your and uh, Mr. Perry's wheelhouse, if you wouldn't mind taking that one. Thank you. Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> Let's see. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah, okay, great. Um, sorry. Yeah, so we've seen in the last, uh, last few weeks that um, Sputnik, for example, and Russia today have been banned in lots of European countries uh, and on uh, lots of big tech media platforms. Um, that that is, you know, um, that was, uh, you know, that was a re really interesting development to see how quickly uh, these platforms moved. When, in the past, we had serious problems with hate speech, for example, uh, being allowed to proliferate. So if you think about various armed conflict around the world, not just uh, with the current war in Ukraine, but also think about, for example, Myanmar and the uh, Rohingya genocide and, and how Facebook or Twitter or Instagram allowed, allowed hate speech to uh, proliferate. And, and we have seen spikes in um, incitement to violence uh, on these platforms. And then with the current war in Ukraine, uh, these, these companies have moved fairly quickly in comparison to previous armed conflicts. Um, I, what I've seen, uh, I've been focusing mostly on Eastern and Central Europe when it comes to spike in hate speech, for example, in, in uh, relation to the war in Ukraine. And, you know, um, I was born and raised in Hungary, which is also, it was part of the Russian sphere of influence or the Soviet sphere of influence, I should say. So we share a history with Ukraine to a certain extent. And uh, it seems that um, Hungarian trolling compared to, for example, Russian trolling and, and the um, IRA or other uh, troll factories that have spread disinformation on um, various social media platforms. What I noticed personally looking at Hungarian trolling is that there has been, it seems like the, the trolling is on steroids at the moment, which to me as a Hungarian is very interesting to see because we've, you know, it seems like uh, these trolls have forgotten uh, the historical, um, memory that we have about the Soviet Union, for example, and previous invasions into our own territories as well. Um, so the, st the strategic narratives are, seem to be the same. There is a lot of negative um, talk about the United States being in decline. Uh, in Central and Eastern Europe, it's also complemented by anti-EU, anti-European Union discourses. 
Uh, so it's almost like the West is com composed of the United States, the European Union, and NATO. And then Central and Eastern Europe somewhat seems to be stuck in between Ukraine and Russia, and then the West. Um, so this information has been spreading about the same, so the same Kremlin talking points have been spreading on Eastern European platforms. Um, and I feel looking at also, you know, hate speech in general, and I research violent extremism, and I compare the United States to Western Europe and Eastern Europe, and then I look at Australia and, and try to make global comparisons. And what I've seen with big tech and global um, social media platforms is what I identify as an English language bias. So this changed in the last couple of weeks when Sputnik and Russia Today have been banned, but these big tech companies have been focusing mostly on tweets or Facebook posts in English. And they really lag behind in looking at other languages and how hate speech can spread in other languages and they are not prepared to deal with this issue. So that's, that's something that um, I personally noticed in my own research. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, I think in the interest of time, we'll have enough time for, for at least one more question, possibly to Mr. Lozato. And Ms. Julian, I, I think we might be able to take your question too. Good afternoon, uh, Cadet Lozato. So my question is for any of those who are presenting on disinformation. I understand that in cybersecurity and cyber warfare, different nation states will have different government bodies that conduct their operations, um, different advanced persistent threats, and sometimes those aren't always coordinated or they use different tools and methods. And I'm curious if the same thing sort of carries over into information warfare. How coordinated or integrated are these sorts of information warfare operations in Russia? Uh, Dr. Manjikian, uh, would, you, would you care to, to cover that one? Thank you. Do I have to turn this on? Yeah. Um, what we see is uh, uh, there was a report that came out from the State Department last year, and they talked about the disinformation ecosystem. And part of the reason they use that term ecosystem is because there are so many different actors. Uh, in the beginning, uh, sometimes there would be people, you know, in places like China who would kind of volunteer to participate, like in a DDoS attack or something like that. Uh, I'm not completely convinced that anonymous is actually just a random group of individuals. Uh, I personally wonder if there isn't some kind of covert support by some form of nation state for anonymous because they awfully, they seem to be awfully good at what they're doing. Uh, someone must have trained them. Uh, but furthermore, what we've seen with Russia is uh, there were reports last week that uh, if indeed they had been outsourcing a lot of their trolling to troll forms outside of uh, Russia, once the currency situation hit, uh, the trolling went down significantly. And a lot of people said that's because they can't afford to pay the troll farm that's in Istanbul or wherever it is. Uh, and then finally, there was a discussion about the role that public relations firms might be even playing in things like trolling. Uh, the idea that you could outsource it to a public relations uh, firm. Uh, and there was an issue with uh, a firm in London that had been doing some work for the Russian government that some people thought you know, wasn't, wasn't quite ethical. So we see public relations firms, we see uh, kind of other kind of commercial things like troll farms that are being outsourced. We see some degree of people acting as volunteers. Uh, and so that's why they use the term ecosystem because it really is a whole conglomeration of different types of actors uh, that probably have very different norms governing how they behave and what they do. Yeah, can I just add one thing there? Sure. Um, that the way the Russia approaches information warfare is, is highly integrated, as you say. And that ecosystem, you can kind of think of as a spectrum, too, from overt attributed sources, like from government officials, state-run uh, news media, all the way to kind of black, covert, unattributed um, information operations conducted at these troll farms uh, or just domains that spring up. Um, and then in the middle, you have this gray area of media sources that, that kind of pick up on the seeds planted at either end and pass them along. Um, so I think in, in one respect, that also points out some of the limitations to the question that was raised before you, where um, uh, while things like deplatforming um, certainly have some short-term effects, uh, when this thing is so holistically integrated across multiple sources and multiple types of attribution, 
you know, one or even a couple platforms, you know, labeling and banning uh, probably isn't isn't enough in that case. But thank you very much. Uh, we have time for one more question, Ms. Julian, if you wish to, or uh, oh, thank you very much. Make it a good one. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Cadet P. Duke. Uh, as Ukrainian myself, I have encountered uh, various uh, uh, Russian propaganda. And um, recently, in this month, Russia blocked Twitter. Today, they officially blocked Instagram and Facebook and recognized Meta Corporation as extremist. Uh, my question is, how do you think will Russian behavior in media space change, considering uh, late uh, last news and war in Ukraine. I'll, I'll leave this open to, to volunteers. Anyone wish to, to take that one? I just like, uh, excuse me, I just I have a small comment. I think that all Russians will continue using those platforms through VPN, so it will be no problem. I mean, my question is not about Russians. Uh, it's obvious that they're going to continue using the services, but rather will do you think Russian government will change their behavior in media space following the blo blockage of uh, all the media sources? Maybe Esther knows about this more. You are closer to Russia, Esther. Maybe you can just come mm -hmm. I, I, I don't expect they'll change the way they wage information warfare mm -hmm. uh, simply based on, on how it's going right now. Um, I think uh, one common misconception that, that we have, uh, I've had for sure, and I think many of us do, is to look at the use of disinformation uh, still through this kind of persuasion lens, um, where, of course, the goal is to persuade an actor to change a behavior. But that's not really necessarily how Russia goes about using information in the information space. Uh, the goal isn't uh, always and often isn't uh, persuasion. Um, so I don't think they'll be dissuaded just because many of their current narratives are being widely debunked. Um, I, think, I think they'll continue to try new things out. Okay. Thank you. Please uh, join me in offering a very warm round of applause to all of our panelists and our discussant, Dr. Parker. Thank you.